Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I've gotten a lot of questions here lately about how to support me and the channel. Well, every video that you watch, simply by leaving a like, a comment, and hopefully sharing it with someone else, does help the channel a lot, and it helps it grow. Now, for those of you that aren't subscribed, or for those of you sitting in the back, please, if you enjoy what you are hearing, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does that also help the channel, but it reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in and get warm. It is time for your daily dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Middle of Nowhere Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Being chased by a bread delivery truck in the middle of the desert around 1 or 2 a.m., it was a giant truck that had no affiliation with anything other than saying bread on the side. I'll expand if needed. My friends and I liked a nightclub. We lived in the middle of the desert. One day, we decided to go venture out on an area we hadn't been to before, but it was a public land. There are a lot of random dirt trails. We drove around for a while until we found a great canyon. The moon was full and lit up the desert. It was serene and beautiful until it came time to leave. Mind you, there is no other light other than the moonlight and my headlights and soon the headlights of the bread truck. It came down one of those random little trails hauling ass and stopped dead in its tracks when I'm assuming it saw us. It just sort of rumbled there, idle for a minute or two, and we all just stood at the back of my SUV and peeked around to see if anyone was going to get out. Nope. They just sat there, waiting and waiting and waiting. After a few minutes of this, I got weirded out and decided we should leave. We piled into my SUV and started driving the opposite way down the trail. The fuckers turned that bread truck around and started following us. I don't know if any of you have driven down any desert trail that isn't monitored, but shit gets fucked. That bread truck was flying down that trail after us. I would turn down random trails trying to get away from it, go over a crest of a hill, but there it was, that energetic truck right behind us. We drove around for a good half an hour or so with this truck just following us. Finally, I was able to get to the highway and sped off. It didn't follow. Oh yeah, the area we were in was very isolated which is why we hid behind my SUV to begin with. It was incredibly weird to see anyone out that far, and not to mention, in a damn bread truck. I was 14 and in the Boy Scouts, and we were on a canoeing trip down the Buffalo River in Arkansas. It was a six-day trip, and it was just our little crew of about ten boys and three adults. We had not seen anyone outside of our crew for days. We would canoe several miles and pick some random spot to sleep each night. This one night, me and a friend decided we are not going to sleep in the tent. We wanted to sleep in some hammocks by the river. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night, being eaten alive by mosquitoes, and decided that this was a stupid idea, and began walking to my tent that my tent buddy had set up and was sleeping in without me. 
The field we chose to camp on that night was quite large, so the tents were spread out very far apart. I am walking by one of the tents, and I see this shape huddled up next to it. I assumed it was one of the boys' backpacks, but it was oddly shaped and could have been maybe a person. It was very dark, and I couldn't really see. For some reason, I decided to kick it while I was walking past it to make sure if it was a bag or not. When I kicked it, it grunted in pain. It surprised the ever-living shit out of me. You must understand that we were in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, so my first thought was that Adam, the guy who was supposed to be sleeping in that tent, was outside of it for some reason. So I knelt down beside him and asked, What are you doing out here? The man replied, I like you people. That's when my heart nearly exploded out of my chest. This was a stranger. This was not Adam. Fear seized me. I noticed he had a knife and a sheath on his belt loop. I was trying my best to stay calm. I will never understand why I thought that I needed to get that knife away from him. I should have run screaming, but I didn't want to alarm him. I went to grab the knife, and he grabbed my arm and said, You need to go to bed. I said, uh, Okay. And got up and walked the remaining 100 or so feet to my tent. I woke up my tent mate, damn near hysterical just knowing he was going to come in any second and kill us. I woke him up and told him the story, and he, being much braver than me, went out there and walked around and came back and said he didn't see anyone, and he thought I was just making the whole story up. The next morning, he woke me up and told me the adults wanted to talk to me. I walk out of the tent, and I can see people's shit just strewn everywhere. Apparently the guy, whoever he was, was going outside each tent and going through the backpacks looking for stuff to steal. That's what I'm guessing. One of the adults had an expensive camera missing. The adults went and searched for signs that someone else was on this part of the river, but never found anyone or anything. To date, this is the scariest moment of my life. Though I am 36 years old now, my wife still mocks me because I still sleep with a nightlight. So this is a story from when I was a 17-year-old moron back in the spring of 2012. While it may seem dramatic, it's had almost a decade to fester in that tiny box in our minds where we shove things best left alone. My little brother and I were spending the weekend with Dad. He had been leasing this cool house for about three years. Near enough to the center of town, I could hop on a bus and hang out with my friends, but right up against a massive forest owned by the local university. I could open the sliding door in my room, and I felt like it could slide down a hill, crash through some blackberry bushes, be on a three-mile loop trail that went up against the fancy parts of the golf course the university also owned. Now, I was, as stated, a dumb teenager, and as a dumb teenager, I decided I would go out and about at night since Dad worked the night shift, and nobody, not even Mom, not God, not the shitty next-door neighbor lady, could stop me from drawing dicks in the golf course sand traps at 1 a.m. if that's what I wanted to do, which I did want. The sand trap dicks are something I do not regret. So for those three years, I did exactly that. When I was too keyed up to sleep or angry at stupid teenage things, I went out that sliding glass door once my brother was asleep, locked it, and off into the woods I went. This was fine, except for the last time that I did it. I skidded down the hill at around 2 a.m., and by this point, even in the dark, I know how to get around the blackberry bushes without incident. 
checked on my shitty old earbuds and got to walking. I wasn't a super athletic person, but I could sprint decently, even if my asthma started burning my lungs, almost instantly. I loved the outdoors. I knew these woods like the back of my hand, so I was overconfident in my safety. Big mistake. Everything was calm for maybe half an hour. I shuffled past the first long stretch of the golf course and kept going until I realized that the forest had gone dead silent. Even at night, in late spring in my state, the woods are audibly full of animal life. I hear nothing. If you had told me shitty dollar store earbuds could save my life that morning, I would have laughed myself sick. But that warning sign might have given me the rest of my life. I remember the thought, I've watched too many horror movies, but my gut still told me that something was off. I knew one tree that was easy to climb across the bridge over the nearby creek and made myself keep going. If I just got higher up, maybe I'd see a reason for the quiet. Then I heard footsteps on gravel, maybe 150 feet back. I decided not to wait. I picked up the pace and heard a sharp bark of shit as I rounded the turn at a sudden sprint. The brush was a thick curtain on that side, but if even if I could have looked back through it, you could not have convinced me to for anything. The bridge was old wood, marking where woods opened back up to a meadow and a golf course on the side I was barreling towards. The planks thundered as I got across. It was so fucking loud, but my heart was beating louder. I heard gravel back near that turn, and to this day, I do not know why I flung myself past the post at the other side and down under that bridge. I remember the red clay mud cushioning my fall with a muted squelch. Spring rains had the creek swollen to a noisy little river. I pulled myself out, blindly cramming myself under the wood as it sloped to meet the bank with the splinters and spiders and praying to any god that could hear me that I was hidden. Then I heard footsteps pounding from the other side of the bridge to somewhere above me. I crammed a filthy, muddy hand over my mouth and tried to breathe deep and slow and silent. They were right there the wood settling heavy over my head as mud plastered my thin shirt and ponytail to my back. The words I heard next were a jumble, but I heard, where, fast, and bitch, over and over and over. I remember wanting to let out a high hysterical laugh at that. I wasn't that fast, dumbass. This was a young man's voice, but it was off and wrong sounding somehow. I wanted to laugh so hard. I had gotten college acceptances two months before. I had my life in order after a shitty stint as a teenager, and I was scared of some dumbass who couldn't even figure out I obviously couldn't have gotten out of sight in more open ground that fast. He was starting to move back the way he came. It felt like a bad joke. Fuck. The rest is anticlimactic. He left and I hid until the sun started turning everything gray in weak morning light. I unfolded my stiff limbs and followed the water out past the woods into a main road. I staggered along sidewalks back to my dad's house for almost an hour. Jumping at shadows, my brother was still asleep when I got back. The dogs were on my bed, whining for pets. My dad came home while I was sitting in the shower and had coffee ready when I stumbled out. I don't know why I didn't say anything or why I wasn't bawling in my overly fluffy robe as he passed me a big mug of coffee and went to take a shower of his own. But I never went back there after dark. I consider myself very lucky. I still like forests and the outdoors because this could have ruined a lifelong hobby of mine. I still never have both earbuds in when I'm walking or hiking to this day. 
always a bit worried if it gets too quiet. So, guy who was in the woods waiting for someone, maybe me, maybe someone else, let's not meet again. Sound fair enough? This story happened slightly over 20 years ago, back when I was 16. During this time, I lived with my mom and stepdad in a remote area 70 miles west of Las Vegas, Nevada. I had gone out to visit with my friends, being allowed to drive myself for the first time ever. I had a lovely time watching a movie and getting food together until it was time for me to head home. The curfew I was given was 10 p.m., with the caveat that if I was running late for any reason to find a payphone and call. The night wrapped around me in my old 71 Chevy pickup as there were no street lights or houses for most of my way home. As I pulled up to the first of two stop signs, I see an older sedan. Old cars are still pretty common in that area. Stopped with his hazard lights on. I pulled up beside it and waited as a man, 30s, maybe 40s, started walking towards me from the other side. Even at this point, I didn't have any alarm bells going off. Being in the middle of the Mojave Desert, providing assistance to stranded people was common. People rapidly got into severe problems, thereby not having enough water when a vehicle breaks down or not realizing that it's a fucking desert and people die wandering delirious away from the highway trying to find help. Anyway, I rolled down my window and as he came abreast of my door, I could smell the liquor on him. I could see another man in the passenger seat, as this was before anyone I knew had cell phones and the nearest payphone was a good 10 minutes drive ahead. I didn't have a way to call the cops on a drunk driver immediately. The man explained that his car stalled and asked if I could help them out. I asked if his car was a stick shift, which it was. So I asked if he was familiar with push starting it. He said yes. So I agreed to as gently as I could push their car with my truck while they turned the engine over. For anyone that isn't familiar with this, this is a way to start a manual car that is having battery or starter issues specifically to get it somewhere to work on it. I knew my truck would be fine, and I didn't feel like it would be wise to get out and try to push their car physically. Push starting the car worked without a hitch, but here's where things go south. They get back out and thank me. They invite me to hang out and have some fun with them. I declined. They pull off to the side of the road, and I continue on my way, only they start following me. So. Here I am. It's 9.50. I'm running late because I stopped to help them. Admittedly, I hadn't given myself much leeway from leaving my friends. These creepy, drunk older guys have started to follow me on a road without any man-made light except for car lights, and I'm at least 10 minutes from a payphone. I think to myself, maybe I'm being paranoid, so... I turned down a road that I know gave me a couple of turnoffs to either head back to town or loop around to the gas station with a payphone. The car follows behind me. At this point, I'm thinking, shit, shit, shit. I take another turn that only leads to a couple houses at the end of the road, and they turned behind me. I take another turn to loop around back to the Had station, and they follow again. So at least I know they are following me and not just heading home. At this point, my heart is pounding. I decided to try something to lose them. I pull to the side of the road. I see them pull up behind me. I wait as the driver gets out of the car and begin walking towards me. His companion also gets out and starts walking towards me. I wait until they almost get to my tailgate, then floor it. My wheels dug into the rocks and poof, dirt, causing a cloud behind me. With the leadway, I head towards the gas station. 
The gas station is deserted, but the payphone is showered in the light from the gas pumps. I call home and explain what happened and why I was running late. My stepdad asks if the gas station worker could be seen, and I let him know I couldn't see him behind the counter. He was probably in the back. I wasn't in trouble, but I was asked to hurry home. So, to the two drunk idiots that wanted to fuck a 16-year-old me on the very first night driving by myself, I hope we never meet again. Before starting to tell you what happened and how I got into the situation, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. I'm a 29-year-old and live in Switzerland, where I work as a cop. Basically, it's like 911. Someone calls, then dispatch sends us for all kinds of interventions. Sometimes, things you see in that job changes your perspectives of what's normal. You meet all kinds of people and sometimes weird places too. But in general, my country is safe and I almost never carry my gun home unless I go training at the shooting range. Also, and because it's linked to my story, I love music and driving cars. It helps me clear my mind. It makes me feel good. Some time ago, I met a club of enthusiasts and from time to time, we meet and do little road trips across the country. I'm so very chill and I'm a calm person and I always try to find a peaceful solution to anything especially at work. I try to always see good in people and prefer talking to them. Okay, here starts my story. Last year, 2022, I went on a road trip with a nice guy I met through the car club. Let's call him Robert to keep anonymity. That trip was really cool and we drove almost all night. It felt like playing NFS which was great because the lights of the cities looked beautiful at that time, and I'm more of a night owl anyway. After that trip, we said we'll stay in touch to make another trip someday. Weeks passed when suddenly I got a message on WhatsApp. Hi, it's been a while. How are you? Still up for a little trip? Tell me when you're free. When I saw the message, I directly checked my schedule and found a free day. I sent him back. Hey, yeah, sure, I'm free on. Pick the day right here. Let me know if it works for you, too. He answers, okay, works for me, too. Where do you want to hike? Then I was confused. Why is he talking about hiking? I checked again the message and noticed it was written by another Robert from my contacts. Not only did I mistaken the dudes by their names, but also because their profile pictures on WhatsApp looked alike. The guy that contacted me was an old acquaintance I met through some of my friends when I did some DJ set parties. It was a few years ago, and we were both passionate by the same music. Then, from time to time, we bumped through each other at concerts. So I had just planned a day with this guy I mistaken for someone else. I felt bad and didn't want to cancel because, although it wasn't the person I thought, that guy was nice too and it's been a while since I went for a hike in the woods or the mountains. So I was like, yeah, why the hell not? Then we started planning the hike. I didn't want something too challenging so I made a proposition. I knew a nice hike that goes through the woods and mountains. The views are spectacular and you get to meet hikers here and there. Also, the path has multiple campfire spots where you can grill some sausages. Robert, too, agreed and asked me if it's okay for me to take him at the train station and we'll leave my car at the parking next to the woods. The day of the hike, I arrived at the train station where Robert, too, was waiting for me. I looked through the place and couldn't find him. Then he waved at me. Here. I got my first red flag. The guy I knew and saw on his profile picture looked different. It was Robert too, but he looked sloppy. He grew long hair and had a beard. I charged up his bag in my trunk and we moved. 
During the ride, I noticed that Robert too smelled bad. It's the kind of odor I smell on the job when I'm confronted with homeless people or drug addicts. But I noticed he came well equipped for the hike, which means he wasn't in a no money situation. So I decided to not judge him because of his body odor and just ignore it. Besides, we'll be in the woods, so outside I wouldn't notice that kind of thing. We stopped at a shop near the woods to get some fire starters, and that's when Robert asked me if I was up to change the hike because he knew another location close to the one I had chosen, and that had some nice spots for pictures. We both carry good cameras. I'm good with a map, and I checked it on my special app. The hike was the same length as mine, but it went near a river, which I found really nice. Okay, let's go check that out. Finally, we parked my car and arrived at the forest. I saw some old barns there and little fields for cows. Our little trip started. During the hike, I was questioning Robert on his life to catch up on time. I already knew he was a smart guy who did engineering school, but I learned he moved out of our city and found some job at a construction company where he does all kinds of calculus to building things. Then, the more I learned about his life, the more I felt something was odd. Robert started telling me he has a girlfriend, but they are going through some hard times, and he thought she might leave him soon. Then, he continued saying that he missed some days at work because he felt depressed and because he wasn't sure it pleased him anymore. He said he might get fired. I was trying to cheer him up and keep him focused on good stuff and advised him to consult if necessary. He asked me about my job and how I react with dangerous people and stuff like that. I wasn't reassured by all this conversation, but I always get all kinds of questions from people, so I can't tell I was shocked or anything. Also, during the walk, he sometimes looked a bit off, like a robot. At some point near the river, we found what looked like ruins from an old mine around 1920 to the 1880s, I'd say so. It was a cool spot and I took a pick or two, but we didn't see any people on our path and the sky got cloudy and it started to rain a bit. Luckily, I was well equipped. I carried everything you need in this kind of places. Water, food, fire starters, first aid, and a knife. We kept moving until we found a campfire spot with a wooden table. We decided to stay there and eat. I asked Robert to get some wood while I'll set up the table and look for little branches to maintain the fire. Robert puts his bag on the table and starts to show me tools he got with him. He grabs a big handsaw, puts it on the table, then he takes out two knives. One of them was a really big one. Switzerland's law is permissive regarding knives in my opinion. I was surprised to see this kind of knife because it's a three hour hike and we're not staying there for the night, nor hunting something. So I decided to pull out the knife out of the knife holster I had attached on my belt to go and get some branches. Robert looked at me, and then he said something in a surprised tone that froze me to the bones. Oh, you took a knife too. Immediately, my mind started racing. Two? What does that mean? Why wasn't I supposed to get a knife when we planned to go into the woods and make a campfire? Robert suddenly leaves to go get what I ask him, and I got an uneasy feeling. It's like my whole body was in alert mode, saying to me that something is going on. I'm used to being around dangerous people at the job, but it's different when you're working fully equipped, bulletproof vest, gun, pepper spray, and you're with your partner in the situation I was in right now. I mean, we were alone in the woods, and we didn't see anyone on the path. From that moment, I decided to keep both my eyes on Robert and keep him in sight at all times, 
especially his hands. That's what you learn at the police academy. People always use their hands to do harm. Moreover, I decided to keep a minimum distance in case he tries to do something. A few minutes later, Robert comes back, puts all the branches he grabbed from the trees, his knife still in his hand. He looks straight at me and just stands there. Suddenly he said, I'm sorry. His tone felt empty of emotions. Immediately I got up and looked at him. I was sure he was going to run at me and try something bad. I got a rush of adrenaline. Then he started to mumble something I could barely understand. We're both here in the woods, alone. We got knives. I'm sorry. What does that mean? Why does he act that weird? Then Robert continues. Let's hug. My body gave me even more alert. Why does he want to get close to me while he is holding a knife in his hand? Is he trying to do something bad? Why would I hug him out of nowhere? Then my mind told me, I've got to get out of this situation quickly, but without making him suspicious. I wanted to leave this place and go home. I finally replied like nothing happened. No worries, man. Let's make the fire eat and something so we can get, um, you know, going home before going completely wet. But I didn't want to get close to Robert. I asked him to get more branches because the ones he got were soaking wet. I took the rain as my opportunity. After he came back, I told him the fire starters didn't work well in the rain and it might be a better option to pack our stuff and head back to the parking. He first looked skeptical and disappointed, but agreed. We packed everything and left the place. I didn't want to talk to him on our way back, but I didn't want him to notice something was odd, so I just kept talking like nothing happened. From that moment, his tone changed a bit, seemed colder to me. I kept him in my sight. After all, we were all alone in the woods. He kept being very negative towards life and people. It made me think he maybe was suicidal in some way. I was happy I did not carry a gun on me that day because I was afraid he might try to do something because of that. Once we got back into the parking where I finally saw people, he asked me if I could give him a ride. I refused, arguing I just got an urgent call from someone and needed to leave. After all that, I kept asking myself, was he trying to do something? Was he just afraid by the situation? Maybe it was odd for him, even though we knew each other and even partied together. Was he planning something? I mean, we were alone in a place he knew better than me, and... He was a really smart guy. All I can tell you is that I blocked him after that and decided to contact our common friends. I knew he was close to Robert, so I explained to him the whole situation. My friend told me that Robert was going through some depression and was feeling bad lately. I told him that I can't do anything legally to help him without his consent, but I advised my friend to call him and make him see someone. A few weeks after my friend had a discussion with Robert, and apparently Robert was open to seeing someone about his problems. Thank you all for listening to my story. Let me know what you think about all of this. I'm still confused to this day. I might be making my mind up, but I saw many people with similar reactions to Robert, and I'm not reassured about this. Any and all opinions are more than welcome. I purchased a hunting property in Southern Maryland a few years ago. It's a decent chunk of land over 400 acres, almost entirely wooded. Its history goes all the way back to the 1660s when it was deeded to some English military colonel. 
It has an old plantation style house built in the 1870s. We were told the original house had burned down. It has a family cemetery with gravestones that go back to the 1780s and lots of overgrown boxwood bushes, the ones you prune into shapes. The place did seem a little creepy right off the bat, but I've always been a pragmatic kind of person. I didn't give that stuff a second thought. The land had been leased by a hunting club for the past 20 years or so. All the stands were set up and trails were already established. It was a perfect fit for us. At one point, I made an off-handed joke to the hunting club guy about the haunted house. It really does look like one. He said something along the lines of, Yep, this place will make your hair stand up sometimes. He seemed surprisingly serious. I thought he was going to make a joke about it, but again, didn't make much of it because it stuck out in my mind. The house was unlivable at the time of purchase, so we were commuting back and forth from a friend any time we needed to be down there to get some work done. I had never been there at night by the time deer season came around. Me and four other guys went opening day for rifle. We have to get our stands pretty early when it's still dark. We each go alone to different stands in different areas. First light is usually at around 6.15, so we got there around 5.15. It's almost a 15-minute hike through the woods to the stand I was at. Opening day, no issues. Nothing weird happened. Kind of a slow morning. Saw a couple of deer, but nothing worth taking. Second day, same schedule. Got there at 5.15 and started my hike out. Part of this hike is on a long and straight logging path. Once I go on this logging path, I started to get the sense that someone was watching me. The feeling came out of nowhere. I've hunted since I was a kid and have had deer snort and stomp at me in the dark. I know the wildlife is always watching, but this felt very different. I shine the flashlight through the trees in all directions didn't see anything and chalked it up to being paranoid because of what the hunting club guy said. It was an intense feeling. I got to my stand, which is what we call a ladder stand. It's basically a ladder going up a tree with a seat at the top. Got situated and was looking down at my phone since it was still dark. Out of the top of my vision, I saw a bright light. I looked up real quick and it was a bluish white glow that lasted about two seconds at about 150 to 200 yards out straight ahead. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. And I thought to myself, what the heck was that? The next closest hunter was probably a close 500 yards away, but to my left. There's no way I could have ever seen this light through the trees. I kept my stare at the same spot for what felt like forever, but never saw it again. I ended up trying to justify it as my head was either seeing stars or maybe a hallucination of some sort. Around 9 or 10 a.m., I got down and walked in that general direction just to see if I could see anything really quick, but there was nothing. We're on private land. There's no one else out here. Two guys got deer that morning. I did not. Decided not to mention the light to anyone. It was probably just in my head anyways. Day three. We switched up who went to which stand, since the two guys who got deer weren't there. One of the guys did end up going to the stand I was at. Let's call him John. The day went on as normal, but was another bummer. None of us saw anything worth taking. John didn't mention anything out of the ordinary, and by that point, I had started to forget about the light and didn't care anymore. Day four was our last day, and was another normal day, but thankfully, I had finally gotten my deer. A small seven point, but I was happy. 
John ended up taking a spike. That means small buck. For the meat, and the other guy decided not to take anything. We went our separate ways. A couple weeks later, I decided to put up some trail cams and sent out a text to the group with a joke about maybe catching the old colonel wandering around. That's when I got a call from John, and he told me he forgot to tell me that he saw the lights in the woods at the same stand I did. My heart dropped. I said, dude, you're not going to believe this, but I saw the same thing. I asked what color it was and in which direction. He said it was like a bright blue or white straight out. Said it was quick on and off, so he couldn't say exactly. I thought for sure at that point the place was haunted, but had to go out there. I immediately drove down and scoured the area in front of that stand. After about 15 minutes walking around in the vicinity of where I thought that light was found, I found an old ladder stand. Looked like it had been there for a long time, maybe five to ten years. Still could be used, but it wouldn't be safe. We had a poacher on the property. I called the game warden, but she said unless I caught the guy there, there was nothing that they could do. Just told me to take the old stand down, which I did. I set cameras up in that area and never saw anybody. I wish I had told John about the light. I still feel like an ass. It was an incredibly dangerous situation for both of us. Thankfully, nothing bad happened. It's been about three years since then and haven't had any issues. I've done a lot of walking, looking for old stands, and I actually have found a couple more that I took down. I tell everyone now who hunts here to tell me if they see anything out of the ordinary. As I'm sure some of you are aware, the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I've been spending a decent chunk of time in the stand with my partner, in life and in most adventures, generally, because we've discovered that hogs have been rooting up the oats and generally causing havoc and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks, attempting to catch the miscreants at it. So far, no luck. Extremely frustrating. At any rate, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand after dark than I ever have in my life. We've been up there from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant or helps paint a picture. There have been a few things that have happened that I've struggled to explain away or rationalize, and my partner is fresh out of ideas, too. The first thing happened about a week and a half or two weeks ago. It was around one or two in the morning, with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area. I was only half paying attention to my surroundings because I had already written the night off as a bust, when all of a sudden, I became aware of a weird whirring or flapping sound. I thought it originated from someone behind me, but my partner said he heard it coming from away and to the front left of us. At any rate, it was loud, airborne and pass quickly over us and away. I'm very familiar with the sound drones make, and this wasn't it. It also wasn't a helicopter. The sound was too small, if you will, if that makes sense. And it wasn't a bird. It sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line. We couldn't see anything. The second thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the stand, but it was weird and out of the norm, so I'll mention it. We live on the same property that the stand is on. 
It was around nine or 10 at night when all of a sudden there was a distant boom, like an explosion, which hit our home like a thud. If you've ever spent any time around heavy artillery or explosives, you'll know exactly what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us asking what the hell had just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion, but the weird part is that my partner did some internet digging and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any information on an unknown explosion. Back in 2016, during the same time of year, we still have no clue what it was. And then lastly, tonight, we were out in the stand once again. It's gotten cold and we've had a ton of rain all day, so everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10 and it was about 10.30. I was preoccupied with trying to keep my fingers and toes warm when suddenly I became aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too, but he has hearing damage, so I don't think he heard the full breadth of the tones. To me, it kind of sounded like muffled voices off in the distance, like several someones having a conversation too far off to make out the individual words. But the direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings. It's just woods. And there were several different tones. My partner said it kind of sounded like a cow moaning, but not quite. There are cattle in the area, and we hear them vocalizing all the time. This wasn't that. And there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound's origins. They carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose into a crescendo, and then died off and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct these sounds were. If I hadn't been listening intently, I don't know if I would have heard it. All of this, coupled with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out in the dark alone, has me wondering. I don't necessarily feel in danger, just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts, and I try to listen to them. I'd love to know what you all think. There may be rational explanations for all these phenomenon. All I know is, I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story, but I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge. Thank you for listening. Oh, by the way, I'd like to add that I'm not a noob or babe in the woods. I've spent most of my life outside. I grew up camping and hiking during almost all times of the year, sleeping on the ground in a tent. You get used to hearing Mother Nature moving around at night. I spent six years active duty military, so I've been exposed to some military grade technology and what that might look like and sound like. Obviously, there's top secret shit hardly anyone sees, but still. I have also worked during all hours of the day and night, always outside. This is the first time in my life, aside from a one-off experience I had at camp growing up, that anything out of the ordinary has happened when I've been outside to hear it. In fact, I've always joked that I must be some kind of different to paranormal activity, because nothing ever happens when I'm around. More than likely, there are rational, ordinary explanations for the sounds that we've heard. But I also try to trust my gut, and if something feels hinky, it's usually right. When I was a theater study student in the Midlands of England, we had to take our little theater company on tour around the local rural countryside as part of the practical side of the course. Being a proper London girl, I wasn't best pleased with the prospect of roughing it 
in a 10-person van. There were 15 of us in the company. But for the sake of my art, I stopped being a silly tart and threw myself into it with enthusiasm. One day, we broke down in the middle of nowhere, and by the time the double-A bloke got to us, and in turn, by the time we got to the campsite, all the spaces in the campsite had been taken. We had three performances locally the next day. It had gone 8 p.m., and it was almost pitch dark. We didn't have many options left open for us. Our director said it would be best if we drove the van into the near forest and all sleep in the van for the night. And as it was too late to continue driving around and having an early start the following day, we reluctantly agreed. We found a quiet part of the forest that was open with not many trees and by 9.30 we were settled into the van, if a little cramped and cold. We were all 19 or 20 years old, and it was a big adventure. At around 11.30, I was stirred awake by one of my colleagues screaming and another bloke saying, This is so bad. We are all screwed. To my complete horror, through my sleep-blurred eyes, I saw that our little van was completely surrounded by about 50 men dressed in what appeared to be old-fashioned rural farming clothes, with handmade torches all burning brightly. I started panicking but didn't scream, and I couldn't take my eyes off the men. They weren't moving an inch, didn't have an expression on their faces, not even when we beat the horn at them. Two of the blokes even got out of the van and shouted at the men. To the total horror of everyone else, Nothing. Needless to say, we were all terrified. Every time we tried to move the van, the men moved a step closer. At 1.30, all the men suddenly just turned around and walked away through the trees. We were absolutely knackered, too tired to drive anywhere else. So, we took turns in keeping watch in case the men came back. But, they never did. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true middle-of-nowhere stories. I'd like to take just a moment and thank the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nat Davies, Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Luz Crispin, Colt Stonewolf, Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes. From the bottom of my heart, I love you. <laughs> if you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.